today I am going to ask you to enter into our Bible story of Pentecost. I'm going to ask you in the first half of this sermon to imagine yourself as one group of people. And then at the end of the sermon, I am going to ask you to imagine yourself as a different group of people. The cool thing about finding ways to imagine ourselves in a Bible story is that we can hear the story in a new way and we can understand things about the story that we may not have realized before or understood before. Today is the story of Pentecost. Today is the story of when a whole bunch of disciples are standing up on top of a mountain and they are speaking in tongues. They are all speaking the gospel in different languages and everybody who is there can hear the gospel in their very own language. And there's a group of bystanders there. There's a group of bystanders, and the bystanders are really annoyed at this group of disciples. Because, you see, Jesus said he was the Son of God. Jesus said that he was the King of the Jews. And it was treason to say that anybody other than Caesar was the King, or that anybody other than Caesar was the Son of God. And so Jesus gets executed by the state and executed by the authorities. And we know that the number one cause of death on a cross is asphyxiation. And so Jesus is killed by the authorities, by the state. And he had this radical group of followers. He had this group of people who followed him around for one to three years, depending on which gospel you read, who preached and taught and healed and said, everybody should have enough. They said, we came to proclaim release to the captives. They said, if you feed someone or give someone a drink in my name, it's as though you've done it to me. They said that everybody should have enough food. Everybody should have enough clothes. Everybody should be treated as fully human. And so there's this radical group of disciples stirring up trouble because, of course, the problem with preaching all of those things is that if you're someone like me, someone with security in life, someone with enough food and enough clothes and shelter, it can be really threatening when this guy, Jesus, and his radical group of disciples are running around saying that I should share saying that I should give up maybe some of my power and my privilege in order to make a more just world for others. And so people remember we've been talking about in the last couple of weeks that the disciples were hiding. They were hiding in locked doors and they were hiding in rooms and they denied Jesus on the cross, the male disciples all did, because they were afraid of also being arrested. They were afraid of being associated with this radical guy named Jesus and being sent to jail along with him or even being crucified along with him. Remember, crucifixion was the way that the Romans executed people that they wanted to execute. And so can you imagine... You are a bystander. You are super annoyed at these disciples already because they've been going around your town, stirring up trouble, proclaiming healing and justice. And now at nine o'clock in the morning, they're standing up on a mountain. Their heads look like they're on fire. You probably think it's a magic trick. And you start telling everybody they must just be drunk. I mean, these disciples, they're all kind of wild anyway. They say things that don't really make sense to us anyway. And so you start saying, oh, they must be drunk. And it's only nine o'clock in the morning. 
I mean, I can imagine myself as a bystander. I can imagine myself being like, oh my goodness, these troublemakers again. They've gathered a big, huge crowd at the top of a mountain, and now they're speaking in tongues, and they are out of control. Please, somebody control them. They must just be drunk, and they're crazy, and they don't know what they're doing, and they don't know why they're doing it, and they don't know why it matters. I can absolutely imagine myself as a bystander. What I can also imagine is if this exact same scenario took place, if this exact same scenario took place when we have a 24 hour news cycle, if this exact same scenario took place and the bystanders are the ones who control the media. I can imagine this story taking place where the story, the narrative becomes, these people are crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. They're speaking in tongues on the top of the mountain. They're stirring up trouble again. They're drunk. I can imagine the frustration of these bystanders. And I can imagine that they maybe are the ones who get to tell the most powerful story. I think it's interesting to look at this story from the perspective of the bystanders because it teaches us something about the ways that stories get told. It teaches us something about what happens when people in power tell a particular story and some groups get it is so interesting that today is Pentecost and we are talking about fire. And there are cities around the United States who are burning. There are people on the ground in Minneapolis at protests. I have a friend who is a chaplain and another one who is a medic and they were in medical tents taking care of people who had been injured in the most recent protests and the police fired rubber bullets into the medical tents where first aid was being administered. Something is wrong. Something is broken. This isn't just one out of control group. This is a group of people crying out for justice. This is a group of people crying out in pain. And those of us who are secure in our lives, what we want to do is be like, oh, they're drunk. Oh, we don't really have to listen to them. One of the powerful videos I watched yesterday was a pastor named Pastor Angela Kebab. And she asked this question as a way of helping us think about story. She said, what if you had seen a police officer kneeling on the neck of a dog? What would those other three professors? What would those other three police officers have done if one police officer was kneeling on the neck of an animal of a dog? We know that with the situation with Amy in the park, that people were much more concerned about the way she treated her dog than they were concerned about her calling the cops on a black man who was looking for birds. There is a cry for justice. There is a hunger for justice. And there is a way that stories are being told that maybe are not the whole story. Just imagine in this Pentecost story, what would have happened if those bystanders who assumed the disciples were drunk were the ones who got to continue telling the story, were the ones who got to write down the story for us, were the ones who got to tell the story in the news. There are problems in our society. There are problems in our world. There are people who don't have justice. There are people who are killed routinely for simply the color of their skin. And I know that this may be really hard for some of you, and this may be, some of you may be feeling angry or upset or threatened by this message. 
But here's what it says at the end of our Pentecost lesson. The Holy Spirit comes like fire to cleanse us, to let us know that something is wrong. And so a journey of anti-racism, a journey of understanding what's going on is a long, complicated process. It takes many, many years, and for many of us, it will never, ever be done. If you are interested in some on-the-ground reports, if you are interested in beginning a journey of anti-racism, if you are interested in understanding what especially Black communities have been dealing with at the hands of the police for years and years and years systemically, it's not about an individual person. It's about the laws. It's about the system. It's about what police officers are asked to do and their complete lack. Of training. If you're interested in knowing more, please let me know. Because just imagine if those bystanders at Pentecost were the ones who got to tell the primary story, what story would we get? What story would we believe? And now I want to ask you to think about yourself as one of, as being part of the group of disciples, being part of the group of disciples. Let's say that you are a disciple and people are accusing you of being drunk at nine o'clock in the morning. But you know, you know deep in your heart that this is the Holy Spirit. That after Jesus ascended to heaven, which is what the story that we heard last week, Jesus promised to send an advocate. Jesus promised to send someone to light a spark of discipleship in us, to light a spark of passion for Jesus, to light the spark of love, and to give us what we need. To give us what we need to examine stories to give us what we need to preach the gospel in different languages. Protest is the language of the oppressed. Protest is the language of the oppressed. There are people speaking that language today and it matters. And if you're confused about why it matters or how it matters or how people got to that point of unbelievable anger, let me know and we can talk about that and share some resources. I know that this is tricky and I know that this might be new for some of you and we will get through it and we will learn about it together because we are the disciples. It is because of that Holy Spirit descending like fire on those disciples and inspiring them to preach the gospel in whatever languages they people could hear it in that mean that we're here 2,000 years later. We wouldn't be here if that Pentecost story hadn't happened. And so I want to imagine today that we are the disciples instead of the bystanders, that we know the real story, that we know the story of a Jesus who came and lived and preached and taught and healed and stood up to the powers that were taking advantage of people and loved people deeply and told them that they mattered and that their sins were forgiven and that they had the ability to repent and to learn and grow and try again and to forgive their sins. We are those disciples. We have been touched by fire. One of the ways that I want to invite you to think about being touched by fire is with your marshmallows. If you brought your marshmallows to church today, I want to invite you to get them out. When the disciples are touched with fire, they become warm and ooey gooey and full of love, full of the story of Jesus. They become wonderful and tasty, and they get touched with fire all together. What happens when marshmallows get touched with fire? 
they become warm and wonderful. Unless, of course, you burn them. Unless, of course, they get so soft they fall off your stick because you're holding your fire roasting stick. Because here's the thing about being a disciple of Jesus. We don't have to be perfect to be a disciple of Jesus. Sometimes we get touched by the fire of the Holy Spirit, and sometimes we feel like we've been burned. Sometimes we get touched by the fire of the Holy Spirit and we're like, this is too much. I can't do it today. And we fall off the end of the roasting fork into the fire and Jesus has to put us back on and touch us again. And so here's the thing. I can sit over a fire and roast marshmallows all by myself. And I can make good marshmallows because I'm an expert Girl Scout camper uh, and spend a lot of time camping and roasting marshmallows. Um, but you know what? It doesn't really taste that great if I do it by myself. I mean, yeah, I can be touched. The marshmallow can be touched by the fire. It can be gooey. It can be warm and squishy inside. But it's not going to taste as good as when I'm sitting around a fire with my friends or my fellow Girl Scouts or my family or my church community. Roasted marshmallows that have been touched by fire are better when they're shared. And our discipleship is better when it's shared. Our discipleship is better when we listen to the stories of the Black pastors who are in Minneapolis right now. Our discipleship is better when we listen to the stories of the people who are most hurting. Our discipleship is better when we let the Holy Spirit touch us, knowing that if we get burned, we will get the chance to try again. Because remember, what were the disciples preaching on Pentecost? The disciples were sharing the gospel in the language everybody could hear. Do you speak the language of protest? Do you speak the language of anti-racism? Do you speak the language of campfires and roasted marshmallows? Do you know how to let the Holy Spirit touch you with fire and then share that marshmallow with those around you and be like, look, I know this Jesus who forgives us. I know this Jesus who gives us a chance to try again. Here, have some. Share with me. You are invited today to move from being a bystander to being a disciple. You are invited into a place of learning and growing. Once the marshmallow is touched by the fire, it is never the same again. It never goes back to where it was. It never becomes the same original marshmallow that you started with. I invite you today to think about yourself as a disciple that is a warm, ooey gooey, just right browned marshmallow that you want to share with others. May you be blessed to fully realize your discipleship today, to learn things you need to learn, to speak up for justice where you need to speak up for justice, and most importantly, to find a language of the gospel that you can share with people around you. The good news that Jesus came to bring us life to bring us life abundantly for everyone to know how deeply loved they are and that they are saved, they are forgiven, and that they are given the promise of resurrection and new life. May you be blessed to be a disciple that shares new life with others. Amen.